So uh, the, the first uh, uh, session following the introductions is a historical perspective of Aloha. And I was wondering, well, how am I going to, who, who am I to, to, to do that? And um, um, to think about the historical perspective of Aloha, I went back and I thought about my forgotten Latin. And uh, I ran into this uh, Latin uh, sentence that I had forgotten for for many years, nanos gigantum humilis incidentis, uh, which uh, although the pronunciation probably was terrible, uh, it, it means we stand on the shoulders of giants. And there are no bigger giants among us than uh, Dr. Bin Cerf and Dr. Bob Kahn, who, were, who are uh, the Turing Award laureates for their pioneering work on the internetworking uh, world as we know it including TCPIP, and also, and just as important, for inspired leadership in networking. So I thought, uh, who better to give us this first uh, uh, introduction, uh, historical introduction to uh, what Aloha became than uh, two of the biggest giants uh, with us. So with that, uh, I'll pass the floor to, uh, uh, I don't tell them how to do anything, so whatever they <laughs> This is completely unrehearsed. Oh, come on. It, Bob, Bob and I are going to do a duet. It's un, totally unrehearsed. We haven't uh, you know, decided on topics or anything else. Uh, but since I grabbed the microphone first, Bob, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask some questions, if it's OK with you. Um, I wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, talk about giants. I, mean, I feel like a pygmy in this room full of giants. It's really cool. The nice thing is that uh, we're still around to celebrate the 50th anniversary of anything. You know, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> that is a big deal. Uh, so I just wanted to tell um, a few uh, anecdotes that will lead up to some questions for you uh, about this, the implications of the Aloha project and some of the things that came out of it. Uh, the thing I love about the Aloha Net. Uh, no, uh, well, I mean, so, so it turns out that um, the thing that's really fun about the Aloha Net is that it, there's this probability element to it. Okay. Now, most engineers and mathematicians kind of like things to come out, you know, exactly right. But the physicists understand probability is important. So in a very funny way, what you guys did is to bring quantum theory to communications in a very unusual way. And I remember hearing about this. I thought, wow, it's so cool. They took those old taxi radios and you know, turned them into something useful. Uh, at the same time, it was such an audacious um, design that sounded like it couldn't possibly work, but it did. Uh, the thing that, uh, the anecdote that I wanted to tell about the consequences of AlohaNet is that uh, Bob Metcalf was visiting in Washington, D.C. at Steve Crocker's house when Steve was at DARPA. And sitting on the coffee table in Steve's house was a report about the AlohaNet. So Metcalf stayed up late and read this thing and decided, hey, that's really cool. He came out to Hawaii. I don't remember exactly all the dates and times, but it was certainly pre-1970. Um, and, or well, it would have been around that time. In any case, uh, he uh, was quite enthusiastic about what you'd done, and then he decided he could do this faster on a piece of coaxial cable. He went to Xerox Park and built Ethernet, along with uh, Dave Boggs. So that was one of the first obvious outcomes of an exposure to your idea, is Ethernet, which has penetrated everywhere and evolved into Wi-Fi and all these other things. The second thing that comes to mind uh, is the packet satellite network. And uh, that one, uh, if I remember right, Bob, uh, Larry Roberts had, uh, had started. And I don't remember whether the slotted Aloha idea came from Larry or from Kleinrock students. Do you I, I think that was from Larry, who was able to show you you could get twice the theoretical capacity by just timing things properly. So the collisions but, would happen at a certain but the time. Pra the practical matter is Larry was interested in a satellite capability uh, for very different reasons than we actually built the, the packet satellite net. But he never actually started it as a project because at that time frame there were no domestic satellites in the US. Um, and he tasked BBNN to figure out how would an imp work with a satellite link. But that was about as some theoretical work and there was nothing more. So the satellite net project really didn't start until a few years later when I got there. And we ended up 
you know, an amazing set of coincidences getting uh, the Intelsat satellites available to us. So uh, one of the things that I recall, since uh, Bob arrived at, uh, at ARPA in late 72, and I went to Stanford, and then later in uh, August or so of, uh, of 76, I joined Bob uh, at ARPA. So my recollection is that um, the packet satellite program behaved a little bit like an aloha net in the sky, because there was, a, I forget what the acronym is, but there was a period of contention. It was like contention priori priority oriented CPOTA. Contention priority oriented demand allocation. I think I got that right. Holy crap. One for me. But, <laughs> but, uh, but in any case, the idea was. It never would have worked over a satellite because of the time delays. I thought we actually did it. No, they were they were actually calibrating when to send things and what reservation slots so they wouldn't get collisions. Oh no, I understand. I thought that there was a period of time, and and they divided this uh, period of time up into two parts: the contention period when you were announcing what your requirements were, and those could have collisions, and you could fail to get your request in. But if you heard your own request come back down again, you made the assumption that everybody heard that. Uh, and, and then you ran a scheduled period of time when everybody would transmit according to the schedule they all had calculated on the assumption everybody got the data that they got. But somebody might not get it because there could have been a local you know, glitch, in which case they would be bleeding at the wrong time. And if you didn't hear your own stuff come back that you transmitted that you thought wouldn't be contended with, then you realized you were out of sync. So the idea was to shut up and listen which is not bad advice for a lot of people. But anyway, <laughs> that was, that was uh, part of the, uh, the magic of the packet satellite program. And of course, it figured very greatly for us in the internet period because it was one of the three networks that led uh, to the uh, design and implementation of uh, internet. But that uh, brings me to the next question for you, Bob. But that was only because we managed to get SatNet to be a separate network if you Remember back then, the BBN plan was to make the satellite net an integral part of the ARPANET, so there was no external way to deal with it as a net. Yeah, well, in fact, in Dick, Bender is, where's Dick, Dick Bender is here somewhere. Where's Dick? Raise, raise your hand. There he is, way over there. In, the, in core so, memory yeah. transfers were what was there in place of routers. Yeah. So actually, that was a big battle that, that Bob had with BBNN about pulling this out. And so Bob gets credit for saying, we should keep these networks separate so we can optimize the way they operate in each of the various media and then figure out how to hook them all together, which is the internet problem. But I wanted to ask a question about packet radio, uh, because that's really, uh, as I remember it, your baby. Uh, I think you were involved in that too. Well, I, I was, recall. but 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 I know I can't claim too much credit for this because um, I, clearly I picked up uh, when I arrived at, at ARPA in '76. I picked up some of the tasks that Bob had already started because he was on his way to becoming the uh, director of uh, IPTO. But but you really started this thing. So the first question is whether the packet, uh, whether the Aloha project influenced your thinking about mobile packet radio. And the answer is it surely did. It's like one, two, three, four, five. Fifth thing on my list here of things to talk about. Okay. But I'm not going to get to my list, guys. Well, no, yes, uh, you no, will. No, I mean, okay. I, I, this you're is, welcome this, to you This know, is jump. even better. This is even better. So the answer is uh, it, it did, but in, in a way that was intended to deal with all of the needs of the military that weren't addressed by the Aloha system and to deal with some of the deficiencies that it had that we thought needed to be dealt with. So give one example. Um, if the military was going to use it, the model that was used at Hawaii w initially, now it changed over time as Norm got interested in going to the other islands and, and the like, or even international, but initially it was to facilitate connections between users and the computer at Hawaii. There may have been more than one eventually, but I, there was one initially. And I, I first visited Hawaii in 1965 to go visit with Wes Peterson. I was on the MIT faculty at the time. But there was no networking activity going on there at the time, so nothing like that ever transpired. But on all my subsequent occasions, there already were networking capabilities available. On. And so I would stay at the hotels in Honolulu and try and dial into the tip at Hawaii, and you couldn't get a single command line through 
the local Hawaii telephone system without errors. So you were typing login. Len Kleinrock likes to talk about that. For different reasons, you would type an L, you might get an L back. You type an O, probably get an I. You type a G, you get a C. And even if you logged in successfully, everything you tried to do was messed up, and it was just not possible. So I could see right from the get-go this was going to be useful. That's why they call it Aloha Telephone, because you know it's just, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. I didn't I know, know that. that. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, uh, I mean, the interesting thing about it, 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 was, it was, in fact, in my view, first really workable wireless computer communication network. I don't know of one. I mean, people had used wireless for many things before. But as a computer network for interacting with computers, I think it was pioneering. And I don't know that anyone could have seen it at the time, but it was really the pioneering step in opening up wireless networking. And today, I mean, how many people in the Western world don't use cell phones with some regularity? I mean, or, or Wi-Fi, for that matter, which is another Wi-Fi, yeah. yeah. So it's all the, the, sort of the same thing. Well, they re that really put that on the map. But when you looked at it from the point of view of myself, someone who had been inter integrally involved in developing the ARPANET, IMPS in particular, I'm thinking, well, if, if all you have is a network that goes to one place, that's not very useful for, for DOD. Maybe it would be in some one place in the world, but why not do something more more like an ARPANET, where well, the nodes can all be mobile. Of course, you know, if you wanted to confine all battles to Hawaii, uh, you know, that wouldn't have been such a bad I, I would vote for that. <laughs> <laughs> in, in any event, uh, you know, so we saw a need for something that involved not just going to one place, but, but going to multiple places and allowing for, you know, relaying, because not everything has a direct line of sight. So, a question about that. When you think about uh, what was done, everybody, I think, must know that the packet radio uh, system was tested here in the San Francisco Bay Area, thanks to SRI. Um, and I did participate in that while I was still at Stanford. Uh, but the, well, the reason I wanted to ask you about this is that the packet radio system by itself didn't necessarily uh, provide for lots of computing capability for the parties who were part of the packet radio system. So the interconnection to the ARPANET was important if you were thinking, how do I show that access to computing resources re uh, remote from the radio system would be valuable? I don't know if that factored into your thinking about the architecture. No, this was, uh, I mean, when we did the ARPANET, um, you know, it was to facilitate the research community's computers interacting with each other. Our task was not to do any of the computing, but to make it easy, make, provide an infrastructural capability for the rest of the research community, which we did. And so my, mo my motivation for getting involved was to do a similar thing where all the nodes could be mobile instead of fixed and connected by landlines. And so that's what we did. Now, uh, one of the attributes of the Aloha system, as I understood it, I was not one of the detailed involved parties there, but. It was one frequency that was used for the users to get to the central computer, and another frequency used to come back. So all the users were listening on, let's say, frequency two, and all the users were transmitting on frequency one. So the user two couldn't, or any other user couldn't hear what the other guys were saying because they weren't listening on the well, channel the, on that the, was being used. On the return channel. They, they were only listening on the return channel. Well, yes, and there was no contention for that because there was only one speaker. Right, and so one of the questions I, I actually had was, and I think I asked Dick Bender that the, last night when I saw him, was where did the notion of carrier sense come in? Because you know, if you were gonna, if you're gonna have packets collide, it would be very easy to just listen and see if somebody else was transmitting and then wait. I had thought that, that there was somebody maybe named Dave Wax. Is, he may even be here today. Yeah, he, he was the, uh, and I thought he came up with some notions about carrier sense and some of the memos, even though they never implemented in the initial version. And that became critical to what Bob Metcalf That's did true. on yep. the Ethernet. But this whole notion of, of carrier sense was something I was very interested in. So in the packet radio context, it was not only to get mobile nodes, not only to get the ability to relay, uh, but also we thought that it was possible to get more powerful computing capabilities in the nodes, which you would need for a lot of that stuff. 
When I started that program, the Intel 40, anybody remember the 404, four bit micro? But yeah, yes. Mark, well, you're a historian, so <laughs> you would. It's right here in yeah. door number 7A. <laughs> you know. And when we actually started the program, seriously, with funding, Intel had just announced an 8008, which we knew was too small because an 8 bit micro, you, I mean, what could you have? Eight, five, ten, handful of buffers. But by the time it, we got ready to actually do the implementation, we had finished the design. National Semiconductor came out with the M16, which was the very first 16-bit micro, which was was big enough. So we had computing that was in there, and we could figure out a lot of interesting things to do. But the other thing that I think distinguished it was that we in, we decided to introduce spread spectrum. Yeah. It was direct sequence spread and now spread spectrum for those of you who. No, don't know what it is. It's, it's a way of actually taking your signal over a much larger band. So somebody's got to use a lot more energy than you do to, to, to jam you or compete with you and, and the like. And back, I think, around World War II, a famous actress named Hedy Lamarr had got a patent on frequency hopping. So you could move your frequencies. And so somebody wanted to mess with you, they'd have to know the exact code for m moving the, it. The, se the, the sequence of frequencies, right. Otherwise, yeah. they, they, they just have to flood the whole channel with too much energy to screw you up. So it was a, an imbalance, asymmetric kind of challenge. And um, so we were interested in, in doing something about it, and I was very influenced by a paper that a guy named Costas wrote in 1959 called Poisson, Shannon, and the Radio Amateur. For those of you who haven't read it, it's a really interesting, it was a conceptual paper, but he basically explained why, you know, this kind of direct sequence spreading made a big difference. And I said, that makes sense to me, because if we're in an urban environment, then you can have all this multipath. We knew that signals bounced around for like, you know, could be as much as five or six microseconds. And if you're going to live in that kind of environment, trying to do exact synchronization of time was going to be difficult. And if data rates ever went up ab above the maybe 100 kilobit range, today we are dealing with what, gigabits? Uh, it wouldn't have been possible to do the synchronization with all this multipath. So, uh, one uh, question about this. In the case of the uh, direct sequence spreading, the idea is that the multiple speakers have different uh, sequences. So that even though they're transmitting in the same frequency, they don't literally interfere with each other because you're listening for a particular sequence of chips. And uh, so I assume that's an important part of the value. Otherwise, you, uh, you need to do the other thing, which was carrier sense, because everybody was talking in exactly the same yeah. frequency. And, and I was actually very, in the back of my mind was the idea that when we all speak with each other, we speak in the same frequency range, and we hear in the same frequency range. And so this notion of coding to have, to you have to know the code is sort of like, you know, you know, the cocktail know, party you, rem problem. you remember Chinese anymore, Frank? If, if you were speaking Chinese to somebody and the person next to you didn't understand it, they could pretty much tune it out as background noise because if somebody else was speaking English and they understood English, they could home in on that and sort of ignore the other. And that was the whole idea that these signals that were coded, you didn't understand the codes, would sound like somebody speaking gibberish in the background. And that was the essence of it. So. Those were the, the key things that were different. Although we wanted to make these radios pretty small, we <laughs> also knew that historically, the idea of spreading spectrum like this was known in the late 40s. You know, me, Bob Fano brought me um, you know, a one-foot pile of papers on reports that MIT had done on this, but they couldn't figure out how to implement it in any practical way. And so one of the things that I set aside to do was to figure out what's a practical way. We, we figured out how to get you know, computing in there, because we now have these microprocessors for the first time. How do we do spread spectrum in a, in a little box? And then I learned about the surface acoustic wave technology. Right. And so we ended up giving a contract to Texas Instruments to build a saw chip. It was a fixed pattern. So all the early radios, we all used the same spreading pattern. Uh, and we also funded Lincoln Labs to build a convolver, which didn't have a fixed pattern, at 100 megabits versus 20. And that's how we made that all happen in there. But it was kind of a, an interesting challenge just to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I can remember, you talk about small radios. Uh, they were about a cubic foot. 
and they cost about $50,000 each. And those of you who've been to the Computer History Museum and have been in the uh, packet radio van uh, that uh, SRI put together, uh, we'll see these giant expensive things. Well, I a cubic foot is a lot smaller than a room this size holding the equipment to do the same job. Yeah, well, so of course, now today, big advance. Uh, you know, we've got these things, uh, and they run a hell of a lot faster. I don't think that they're spread spectrum, though. I, I'm, I'm assuming not. Maybe somebody, uh, no. Yeah. Really? Wow. Okay. So, oh, the Qualcomm guys are doing, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so we got in our pockets the result of the, uh, the activity that went on. What, plus but, you know, the other ago. thing you mentioned was about this was kind of randomness notion. I remember after we did the very first demonstration of the ARPANET at the uh, Washington Hilton Hotel in right. 1972, it was just before I went to DARPA, uh, there was a, a group of people from the outside, I don't know exactly where, but... Aliens? Uh, well, I think there were some reporters, some um, folks I, from at and and elsewhere. <laughs> Probably, but there was an article written in the papers uh, shortly thereafter that basically reported on this demonstration and said you know, it was really unfortunate because it didn't obey good data principles. And I remember looking at that and said, what are good data principles? If it didn't obey it, you know, where are they written down? Well, nobody could explain it. But the interesting thing is that when we did packetized voice experiments later on, I remember talking to people at some very distinguished institutions in the U.S. who will remain unnamed for now. And uh, they were trying to understand how you could actually send voice over something like an Ethernet and make it work, you know, packetized voice, whether it's over the ARPANET or the... Or the and what they said is doesn't obey good data principles. The same thing. Yeah. So, I mean, you can make a lot of things work when you have excess capacity. When everything has to fit neatly into every little interstitial space, then you've got to figure out how to optimize it. So, yeah, just since you brought up packet voice, um, Earl Craighill is here. Where is Earl? Wave a hand there. Right over there. So, Earl used to be uh, in the packet radio van buzzing around, uh, experimenting with uh, low data rate packetized voice. And my favorite story about this is that uh, Dwayne Adams, who was in the office at uh, ARPA at the time with Bob and me, was responsible for looking at uh, you know, low data rate um, voice uh, compression. And one of the compression schemes is called linear predictive code with 10 parameters. It, it modeled the voice track as a stack of cylinders whose diameters would change as you were speaking, and that little stack was excited by a formant frequency. Uh, so it reduced the, what would have been a 64 kilobit signal to 1800 bits a second. And I, when I was at ARPA, one of the things I was supposed to do is go demonstrate this capability uh, to some generals at the Pentagon. And I was trying to figure out how I was going to do this because the uh, compression scheme lost a certain amount of fidelity. And uh, so anybody that talked through the system sounded like a drunken Norwegian. And one of the guys who was involved in our uh, uh, packet satellite program was Ingvar Lund at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. Who sounded like a broken Norwegian? Yeah, well, <clears throat> So anyway, I had him call through the, I don't know, try to avoid that question. Uh, <laughs> he, I had him call through the Autovon system, which was the standard military voice thing. And then I had him call through our packet voice system, and it sounded exactly the same. And I just didn't tell everybody that everybody would sound that way if they talked through the compression system. Uh, but Earl was out there uh, early, and among others, of course, at SRI. Uh, experimenting with stuff that we take for granted today. I mean, the fact that we can do FaceTime or Zoom or, you know, Google Voice or what have you, or Google Video Conferencing, uh, is a direct outgrowth of a lot of that early work. And the fact that we were ambitious enough, maybe crazy enough, to actually try that and packet video in the 70s and 80s, uh, I find is amazing. And so I want to put a, a, a kind of a, a big picture observation here. While I was a graduate student and later a uh, program manager at ARPA, the thing that has struck me about this whole history of ARPA is how it keeps getting its fingers in the most interesting pies for literally decades. And at the time, and even today, just sitting here in this room looking at all the people who've had their fingers in the pies, ARPA is the most amazing place that found the right thing to do 
that everybody else would probably reject out of hand as being not worth the time and effort. And so it's astonishing that an agency can be that creative. And it's a consequence of the people like you who helped make it that way. And so I think it's just a tribute to uh, that one institution. It's so much of what we see today is a consequence of the research they sponsored. Well, you know, virtually every organization that got involved in networking in the early days had the nature of that or the perception of that place changed as a result. You heard from the dean at uh, Hawaii that, uh, you know, they now see that as the place where Aloha emerged. Uh, for DARPA, when they talk about their main successes, the, they, they talk about the internet for sure, but they mean that writ large, so it's everything that led up to it. Um, they, they mention a few other things that they can't really talk about, you know, like the stealth program and things like that, but it's changed the, the perception of that organization. You know, Len Kleinrock uh, constantly touts the fact that UCLA was a key player early on. Uh, Stanford, you know, recognizes the fact that it was an early player, thanks to your work there. Uh, same was true. BBNN got bought out by uh, communications firm. I mean, eventually uh, became part of Verizon uh, until they spun it back out again. So it's changed everybody that's come in contact with it. And I think because it's changed the world. And uh, people are counting on things that made a big contribution. And I think the Aloha one is probably the earliest of those efforts. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure the exact date when you guys started the effort there, but you know when I got to DARPA, it was already underway. Um, you know, I had many meetings out there uh, uh, concerning it in one way, shape, or form. But it 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 has led to a wireless revolution, and I think you trace the lineage; it goes right back to that. Packet radio also played an, an important role in that, but it came a little later. Uh, in fact, Bob Metcalf was on the working group that I set up to figure out how we were going to do it. And he had to drop out around, I would say, April or May of 1973 when Xerox decided they were going to go public with their Ethernet and they didn't want to get it tangled up uh, in possible patent kinds of claims or, or the like. But uh, a very important and, and um, seminal time for almost everybody or anybody because everything was new. And to get back to your comment about DARPA, I mean, those were golden days because there was so much low-hanging fruit that you could just pluck off and make, make a name for yourself if, if not a real scientific contribution. Uh, but the success is sometimes, uh, you know, the, the basis of change in organizations. You become too well-known, you become viewed as somebody who can make a difference. And DARPA today is still a pioneering organization, as you say, but it's a very different organization than it was back some 50 years ago. Well, it's a lot harder to walk in the front door these days. I, I, you, know, you stand there and get yourself blood tested and uh, fingerprinted and whatever else it is do and they make do sure that, that you're they? okay. I, they've never blood tested me. <laughs> oh, well, and, <laughs> and you haven't had the dog sniff your butt either? Wow. I mean, Oh, that's the one where you go into the White House. They have this dog, and there's this windblower. Some of you have been there, and it's kind of weird. You know, <laughs> what's he doing? He's sniffing. Um, so I, I want to um, pre-ask some questions um, for uh, Norm and Frank in particular, because we're going to hear from you. So one of the things I'd really love to uh, hear about is what triggered the idea at all. I mean, what on earth were you thinking? Uh, and, you know, did you have a bunch of broken taxi radios and you said, what the hell can we do with them? And so I'm very interested to know what led you to, uh, to this because it's clear that, you know, I hope anyway from this conversation that there was this, uh, like a uh, uh, cascade effect of ideas. When you finally show that something's possible, that no one believed was possible, then suddenly you believe other things might be possible. And so a lot of of the value of this kind of exploration is exactly that. It's triggering new ideas. So I'm really curious to hear about that. I'm also curious to know what else on your list of six things did you want to talk about? We may not have time for it, but what, what else is on your list? Well, there's more than six, but let me, let, let me say that um, one of the things I thought you might find interesting, I don't know if they had problems with frequency assignments uh, in Hawaii at the time, but when we did the packet radio uh, program, uh, one of the things that I was particularly interested in, in showing was that a spread spectrum system could exist 
in a band that had other services on it and not interfere. This is the FAA thing. Oh no. boy, I yeah, love this yeah, story. Yeah, it is. It event, eventually is an FAA thing and a, and a Scarlet A or something. Um, the the fact of the matter is that uh, the, in order to produce a piece of technology in the Defense Department, you got to use. Um, typically, you use military bands, and they're allocated. And there's a group in Washington called it's called IRAC, right. which stands I R A C, C stands for Q, the right. Interdepartmental Radio Advisory Committee, and it's chaired by somebody from the military. It's run out of uh, FCC, but it's staffed by the military, and they control the military frequencies. So to build a piece of equipment, you've got to get an, an allocation of the band in which to build it. Um, and so if you don't have that, you're not, you're not allowed to build it in DOD. You can't just willy-nilly build a piece of equipment. And so I wrote a letter to the admiral who was in chairing Iraq. And I said, I would like, uh, we're building this, uh, uh, actually we wanted to build this uh, testing equipment because I wanted to sort of do the testing of this. Um, and we did the testing out here in the Bay Area uh, to see whether this technology could in fact exist with other services in the band. So I asked him if he could allocate, this is step number one of the process, could allocate a frequency band for us to test. And I told him that we needed 20 megahertz and we will need to make it agile over a 100 megahertz band so they could tell us where we build the radios to work over a 100 megahertz band we pre-allocated to some 20 megahertz place that they later told us. So they said they didn't have any heavily used bands they could make available. They had a lot of heavily used bands, but none they could. So I said, fine, we'd like then a lightly used band. You don't have any of them either. So I said, no, 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 no. You cannot just tell no to us because this is something that has military significance. They finally said, oh, okay, all right. So it's only test equipment, right? Yeah. So they allocated us the 1,400 to 1,500 megahertz band to, op to operate in. Now, it turns out that this is the band in which all the on route air traffic control radar systems in the country work, <laughs> including the one at SFO. Um, but Having gotten the allocation, we then went out and Collins Radio built the test equipment. We spent about $3 million because we had to build the chips, and it was a complicated thing to do the testing. I just wanted to understand what the thresholds were. Mm -hmm. When would this technology when, interfere? When would the planes fall out of the sky? That was the No, I wasn't. Sorry, well, I didn't yeah. know about the planes at the time. I just wanted to know about interference <laughs> with these other systems, whatever they might be. And so uh, we built the equipment. Second stage... Once you built it, you're not allowed to use it until you get a frequency assignment. So you go back and you say, okay, you, you've given us permission to build it. We want to test it in the San Francisco Bay Area. Please give us a frequency assignment to use. And then they have to go around and make sure who else is using what there so it doesn't interfere. And they came back, what? You know, you can't use this in the Bay Area. This is the airport here and there are planes landing. I said, look, you gave us approval. To build the equipment, we built the equipment, we're ready to test it. It's our hypothesis, it won't interfere with anything, but we want to understand what the, the limits are. <laughs> Sorry, you can't use it. That was the official word we got back. So we have these back channel discussions with people in the FAA, staffers, not, not, the, not the bosses. The bosses were pretty firm, no. The staffers said, well, you know, if you outfit everybody that's involved with walkie-talkies, so Don and the van probably would have it, or they were up in Scarper Peak, I think, you know, shooting right into the radar station. I was up at Mount Tamalpais, which is just north of San Francisco. There's an Air Force station there. I remember I called my dad when I was up there, and I said, we just had two feet of snow in San Francisco. He says, not possible. They've never had two feet of snow. Well, they had two feet of snow up at the very top of Mount, Mount Tam that day. And so... Um, we actually got permission from the staffers, not from their, their bosses. Oh. We ran these tests, and we were able to show that, you know, in the normal mode of a packet radio operating, if you were looking at a radar screen, you know, even at full power, you really couldn't see much of anything. This no, I, I, no problem. Um, I thought we were at 1710 to 1850. Do I, did I misremember that? Yeah, yes, you, that was where we were for the radios when they were actually built. This was testing uh, equipment. Okay, got it. This was the testing stuff. 
So they didn't yeah. notice at all. I mean, I was in the Air Force place, and you know, you could see a little specular granularity, but not. I mean, the airplanes were bright spots. I mean, you could. This was not going to interfere with anything, even if it was there permanently. So that was fine. So the next thing we did, and I don't remember who did it, um, whether Don and his crew did it or whoever, but we put a horn, oh, right? I mean, a horn antenna with 20 dB gain looking right down the, the, the radar system. And we started to run that in packing modes, you know, you know, cranking it up. And even when you got there, I mean, all the front end electronics were screwing up the signal so that it didn't really interfere. So we knew in packet mode, even at 100 times the power going in, that was 10 watts base power, so this would have been quite a bit of power uh, going in, didn't interfere. But then we put it in continuous mode. Now these are, these are antennas that kind of swirl around, so on a screen you will see, you'll see, this you'll see a sector, yes. like a pie slice, uh, during the time you're going in. So as we cranked it up at normal power, you couldn't see. Wow. Much of anything it wouldn't make any difference. And as you cranked it up, it eventually got to the point where you could sort of see there was now a sector that was starting to get white. And it would have eventually blanked out all the stuff there. So at that point, they told us to stop. And we did. Yes. But we got all the data we needed. We knew what, what all the limits were. And then I got this wonderful letter back from the head of the FAA saying, you know, you ever watch Casablanca? You know, it's come to our attention that there's gambling. You know. You know, we just learned that you ran these illegal tests out in the Bay Area, and he slapped my wrist. There was no penalty for it, but uh, that, that was there's, probably a fun there's thing. There's packet switching going on there. I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, that's, that's, that's right. That's so right. I'm conscious of time here, and, and I don't know where our timekeeper is, but we should be concerned about that. Okay, so do you want to try some questions from the audience, or do you want to prosecute? Yeah, what, yeah I, I mean... Why don't we, why don't we, well, let's see if there are any uh, or issues that people yeah, want to raise with our... Well, let's take uh, questions from the audience. Okay. Are there any? Or comments, uh, complaints, uh, recommendations? There's one over here, Alex. I, thank you, um, Vint and Bob. This is wonderful just watching this tag team. Um, We've done this a bunch of times. I know. And, you know I'll, I'll tell you, we did this once at the invitation. I was at the university. Was, what's in Bozeman? Montana State. You know, and they, it was an audience of about, what, 300 kids or, or more. And we went on for about an hour. And then the guy said, well, we've got to close it because students have other things. Well, our students objected. You know, we, we don't want those. <laughs> no, it's great. For another it's great. Hour. I'm not objecting. <laughs> Um, you know, I was struck by something you said, Vint, which was the story of, um, of Bob Metcalf finding a report on someone's table, Steve Crocker's table, you know, just because he happened to be there. And, I, you know, that just really makes me wonder about how we advance in engineering and, and how that process works, that process of of happenstance and serendipity and all that. I mean, I'm sure that that played even a you know, bigger role in, in your lives and in your work. Um, how, do we, how, do, how do we think about innovation with such a, an undeliberate and accidental sort of discipline? So I have, I have one answer for that. Uh, Raj Reddy um, was very concerned uh, about digital libraries being so precise that if you looked up something, you got exactly and only what you were looking for, end of story, perfect, right? And he said, you know, it'd be a lot better if you were wandering around in the stacks and you pulled out the thing you were looking for and you discovered the book next to it might be even more interesting. Well, I can tell you as hard as we try at Google, uh, our, our search engines are not perfect. And so we pull back all kinds of stuff. I have the feeling that serendipity uh, is very critical to discovery and ideas. But it's also a question of people. And, you know, it's rooms full of people like you that often generate some pretty exciting outcomes. So I'm always curious, whenever meetings like this happen, I wish that I had some way of tracking to find out which ideas were hatched at this meeting that you know, birthed later, you know, nine months or a year or two later. Do uh, you have any thoughts on serendipity? Um, I, you know, I, I, I have a different view of it. I think, you know, for the most part, uh, the question is, how do you get the itch in the back of your brain that says, this is something to go think about. 
you know, for me, it's it's relatively rare that anything that I got interested in was by virtue of picking up a magazine on a table or reading it or something like that. It was always, you know, what if we could do this? Or, you know, this new technology showed up. Maybe we could apply it over there. What if we put these two things together? It was always cross-disciplinary kinds of things that were, that were driving me. Um, you know, the things that were more serendipitous were, for me, procedural. Like for, I'll give you one example. Uh, you, you had mentioned the packet satellite program that Larry Roberts uh, had started thinking about. He didn't really start it as a program. He was also thinking about packet radio. He wrote a paper on a terminal packet radio, but it was just a paper, you know, sort of like Jules Verne describing a submarine, but he had no way of actually implementing it at the time. Um, in the packet satellite program, and we, we started it out, there were no domestic satellites. And so I was looking at it and saying, okay, the only thing I can conceive of is using Intelsat. So I started my discussions with Intelsat, and they said uh, we had a tariff issue because they had only two tariffs there, so we had to work the tariff thing so you could do packet switching on it. They had a point-to-point -point tariff and a point-to-multi-point -point tariff, but it was an N-squared kind of tariff if you figure out all, Your the, microphone. Yeah. all the channels that you had to put together. Um, it turns out that uh, we were able to get a new tariff out of Intelsat, but ComSat was the U.S. representative, and ComSat wanted no part of it. Because the idea we p pitched the ComSat when we understood they had to be the, the interface was that this will make more efficient use of satellites. And they said, Bob, you don't understand. This was where serendipity comes in. They said, we make our money based on the total value of our asset base. So we want to put up more satellites. We want to use them less efficiently because the more satellites, the more money we can. Yeah, put that 4,800 bit per second modem on the shelf. Don't do that. It'll have the number of lines that we can sell at 2.4. And that okay, was the problem with the ARPANET when we tried to get the Bell 304 modems in place. Exactly that, that yeah. kind of issue, except that was 108 kilobits versus 50. Um, and so they said, no, we're not going to do it. If you want to buy all these multiple channels and pay all this money, that's fine. So at that point, I was kind of stumped because we didn't have a way to go there. Well, so I went back and I read the enabling legislation for ComSat, prompted by you know, thoughts about maybe there's something in there that can leverage it. Well, it turns out there was a little loophole. It said that if for some reason ComSat wasn't providing services that were needed by the Department of Defense, the oh. DOD could go directly into Intelsat. And so I said, okay, that's fine, but um, suppose they still say no. You know, I mean, DOD is probably not going to get orchestrated to deal with that. Well, there's a friend of mine named Fred Bond who was then running the Military Satellite Communication Office, which was part of the DCA, and he was in charge of all the military satellites in particular the DISCUS system, the Defense Satellite Communication System. And I said to Fred once, look, we're having trouble with ComSat. Would it be possible to use any of the channels on the DISCUS system to do this? And he said, well, he said, uh, you know, we really don't have a lot of spare capacity here. He said, but I'd be willing to give you a channel that would probably have been a slightly lower bandwidth channel, maybe 9.6, but you'd have to agree that we could preempt it if we needed it for DOD. I said, great, this is just for research purposes, that works. We only have about five minutes left. So we, I agreed that we would do that. So I called ComSat to tell them we didn't need their support anymore. And I said, oh, by the way, in the event that the discus thing goes away, we have this way of going direct into Intelsat, which they didn't want to see as a precedent for any reason whatsoever. So that was a kind of a, a serendipity in process, things that happened that you didn't realize and uh, but, but ne never, never in terms of the ideas to work on in the first place, at least not for me. So just to put a cork on that particular story, Western Union International was the representative of ComSat. And so we negotiated with them for a service, which Bob called multi-destination half duplex, because there were half a dozen ground stations and they were sharing the channel. And so we got this short proposal back from Western Union International that said, uh, we we're very pleased to uh, offer uh, DARPA the uh, multi-destination half-duplex system. By the way, what is it? <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, we ended up on Intelsat 4A uh, with a shared 64 kilobit channel.
The interesting thing about it was the, this MDHD was actually the defined name of the tariff in the Intel SAT tariff regs, but it was, it was unlike one where you got a point-to-point -point service, you had to say where the destination was. Here, it was like plugging into an Ethernet where you didn't have to say who you're going to talk to. You could talk to anybody who was listening. And to you just Ethernet. hoped that somebody would, that you wanted to talk to right. was listening. Right. And so this said, we would like a, you know, MDHD channel to the satellite, and we didn't say to where. And so the questions were coming back. Well, who do you want to talk to? And we didn't know who to talk to. And so it's kind of interesting. OK. We're almost out of time anyway, so I think we should wrap up. But uh, thank you, Bob, for uh, all those wonderful responses. And thank you all for listening. I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. OK. Thank you.